What's going on, Packer Nation? Welcome back to the Packer Day podcast. As you are listening to this, we are officially one day away from Packers 49ers. It came fast. We had an amazing wild card. Well, we had an okay wild card weekend, uh, but it led us to this point where we've got uh, really amazing, you know, four games lined up this week. I am so incredibly pleased to be joined once again by the one and only Mike Wall. Mike, how did you enjoy wild card weekend? How are you doing? And what was your biggest takeaway from this past week? Well, I'm doing great, Andy. Great to see you. Uh, I thought it was a I thought it was a fun weekend. Certainly, uh, the wild card weekend. You know, one thing you can say is maybe we don't need the seven seeds. That that seemed pretty obvious. Yeah, I think everybody knew that going in. Some great football games. A little bit of controversy with with officiating and whatnot. Um, you know, Cowboys showed their stripes. They, they kind of built back. You know, there's there's some comments that were made. I think yesterday by Mike and being nervous. Like I don't know if you ever want to get into that, but that was that's very very telling. Yep. I think the team that's coming to play here in Green Bay, uh, San Francisco 49ers are a good team. They were a good. They were kind of one of those teams you pick and go, man, they're pretty dangerous coming in. I think they're uh, they're playing at a really high level. And maybe the surprise of the weekend for me though was, man, the Rams look like the Rams look good. They did legitimately good. Like, oh my gosh, if Tristan Wirfs and, and Ryan Jensen aren't playing for the offensive line of Tampa, like the Rams could beat Tampa. I didn't. I agree. I had no idea that that was even a possibility two weeks ago. No, I, I totally agree. That that was the one that took me by storm. I, and I don't know, like, I think the Rams played phenomenal in that game. And I think they showed everything that they need to, to be able to compete with Tampa. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that game. Um, I also thought Arizona played just terrible. And they were a team that was, yeah. you know, clearly trending in the wrong direction prior to that. But that was a that was a telling game from them as well. So I, I do want to ask you about the, the McCarthy comments, though, the, since you brought them up. That I, I felt it was a little bit interesting. But what was what was your takeaway from the, the nervous comments? Well, so as an athlete, I'm just going to give this perspective, right? Yeah. You're nervous before a, a big game, a game, a, a standlock game. You you pick the environment because the environment doesn't change. Like football doesn't change. You play high school, you play college, you play pro, you play, you know, playoffs, you play Super Bowl. The environment doesn't change. External factors like weigh on you differently, media, you know, attention, social media following, that changes, but the game doesn't change. So if you're nervous, if the word that comes out of your coach's mouth is nervous, then as a player, you're only nervous because you don't feel like your preparations put you in a position to be successful. That is the only reason you should be nervous, right? right. You don't you don't trust that what you have done or what has been done around you has put you in a position to find success on Saturday or Sunday. And that is a huge, like, that is a really damning word. And I know that Coaches misspeak, like you get paid to, to speak for a living, right? I, I'm not a wordsmith. So so I, I'll, I'll say some things and go, oh, maybe I shouldn't have used that word. But then to follow it up and kind of how they discussed it, right? There's like, there's a difference between nervous and then he used angst, but there's a difference between being nervous and being anxious or excited, right? right. There's, you, you are going to get excited for these, you're going to have anxiety, you're going to be anxious for these moments, but nervous sounds and the way that they played and some of the mistakes that they made and the penalties that they have and all of the stuff, the way they ended the game, it doesn't feel like they felt confident in the preparation that they had leading up to that moment. And that's why they came out flat. That's why the bananas ran down their throat the first quarter. That's why the game ended the way it did. I mean, it just, it, it's just not a good look considering how talented they really are. It isn't. And it's interesting, too, because you've got a head coach that has a lot of experience. You've got two coordinators that are currently being vetted out for head coaching jobs throughout the NFL. Um, and you would think that this would be a team that would be extremely prepared for that sort of situation. Um, in a way, uh, in, in a roundabout way, one of the things I was initially concerned about, like if Dallas ever came to Green Bay is, you know, if anyone could prepare you know, a team for the weather and the elements, it would be Mike McCarthy. He lived here and, and played here and did everything that would give me some pause. Like, all right, they'll probably be well-prepared, but they did not seem well-prepared for that game as you may. And it, 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 I think you put it perfectly. It's, it's a telling comment that not only did I, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but not only did he say they were nervous, but that nervousness, he said like permeated within their play for the first few quarters of the game, which is why they came out and maybe didn't play as well through those first few quarters that that's shocking and surprising. And, and to me, it is, is more telling on the, the coaching staff than it is on, on the player. Cause I guess it's, it's, it's one of two things, right? Either you don't have the right players uh, in that mm -hmm. situation that you're, you're not building your, your program in the right way with guys that want those moments and are excited for those moments, 
or you have the right guys and the coaches couldn't get that out of them. And to me, it, it, I agree with you. It seems to be the latter of the two. Well, I think that the hard thing is that from an organizational standpoint, there's nobody that has more pressure on them year in and year out than, than the Dallas Cowboys. They, they, Jerry Jones has built this, this almost cartoonish, like <laughs> legacy organization yeah. that they're, they're America's team. And even if they haven't won a, you know, a, a Super Bowl in 20, 30 years, like it doesn't matter. Um, anybody who's done well there goes on and has like a budding TV career or is it sitting in the box? Like, they they run the like he runs the NFL, right? And so the pressure that whether you know directly or indirectly, some of it probably a little bit of both, he puts on his coaching his his head coach his coaching staff how, how that is how that resonates throughout you know the entire the, the, the players on the team the building that they walk into every day I mean everything there is like we've done everything you all you have to do is go win what's the big deal and it's not like it really isn't that easy and you could see how. Some people like, you know, pressure, you know, pressure turns coals and, you know, coal into diamonds, but it, it also crushes souls. And you can see how not everybody can handle being under that spotlight and that scrutiny. That's not for everybody. Um, you know, certainly it just it's too bad because it's almost it almost feels like like, oh, here we go again with the Dallas Cowboys. Like I was I like watching Stephen A. Smith from time to time. And, you know, he's like he, he just hates on the Cowboys fans. And it's like. Every year he knows one thing for sure. They're going to, they're, they're going to find a way to disappoint. And it's always, it's part of that's because the expectations are probably higher than they should be. They deserve to be. Yeah. I think it's very similar to the Yankees in baseball. And, and I see, you know, players all the time who will play well for these smaller market teams. And then they get signed by the Yankees to this massive deal and just never live up to the expectations of that contract because of the pressure of the contract, the pressure of playing in New York, the pressure of extended media and everything. And again, this sort of this empire that's been built. I see things happen like that all the time in baseball. I think you're right. I think it's very similar with the Cowboys as well. And some of the pressure that they have to endure because of the expectations and because of the almost circus like atmosphere that it can be because of all the, the media and everything else. So yeah, I think that's a great point. Let, let's speak, you know, we, we're obviously talking about Cowboys here, but the, the 49ers were the team that walked into Dallas and ultimately beat them. That's the team that's now trying to walk into Green Bay and do the same. We could go in a million different directions here. I want to start, as always, as we usually break down offensive line play, since uh, that's I know your, your A1 expertise, not that you don't have multiple, but the 49ers offensive line to me, especially with Trent Williams, you've got a veteran in Alex Mack. I know McGlinchey's out, but overall they've got a very talented O-line and I believe, and it extends past the O-line, right? When it comes to a blocking, because Certainly. George Kittle is basically, as you've talked about, and, and I've talked about basically like a sixth offensive lineman for them. Use Jack is such a crazy chess piece for them who can come out and, and, and make devastating blocks in a variety of different ways. But talk to me about this 49ers offensive line and extended, why it's such a challenge and, and maybe touch base on the greatness of Trent Williams as well. Yeah. So I think across the board, they're all, they're all good. Trent Williams is, is kind of the, the Larry Allen of this generation. And, and, and by that, I mean, people are literally afraid to play him because he just, you know, he takes your soul um, physically. Like he's the guy that can put you five yards on your back over and over and over again. And, and, you know, we can talk about it. these guys are grown men and they're professionals, and everything, but they don't like to get embarrassed. And he's one of those guys that can embarrass you. Um, he's, but it's funny because he's one of those guys that a lot of these guys are great when you're, when they're running, you're running at them and he's great when you're running at him, but when you're running away from him, he actually, he makes the play more often than not because he's able to hand fight and cut down that, that three technique on the backside and create that running lane for Elijah Mitchell or Debo Samuel. Um, if you kind of look at the way that they're structured, one thing that really stands out is, well, two things for me, really. The first is they're in 21 personnel a lot. Yep. And you saw even in the Dallas game early on, if you're going to go into 21 personnel, so for, that's that's two backs in the tight end, right? And you that just basically mean that you checks in the game and they might not have Elijah Mitchell in, they might have Debo Samuel in, but you have to treat it as, as 21 personnel. And if you're going to come out and play nickel against 21, that means George Kittle is going to block a safety if you decide to bring a safety in the box or you're going to play six in the box, you are going to get absolutely gashed every single play. You might get one or two plays there with somebody, you know, guesses right and gets lucky. But if you're if you're going to go out like the Dallas Cowboys did in the first quarter, hey, we're going to go ahead and play nickel against your 21 personnel and have 27 try to take on George Kittle. Like, are you joking? And 
And that is, you know, in this league, a lot of people don't know how to play a seven man box without bringing a safety down anymore. Like they don't have the personnel for it. Green Bay does luckily. They do. But the other thing that sticks out for me is their, their entire team blocks. Their entire team blocks. Debo Samuel is in a slot. Great block. Use check. Great block. Kittle. Great block. I like I he'll block. They are about that. And when you see a really good running team, team that uses their running game for their explosive plays, because that's really what the 49ers do, right? They're kind of relying on scrimmage plays, either screens or the running game to create their explosive explosive for plays sure. in their offense. The only way that happens is if you are uh your wide receivers are super dedicated to blocking at the second level. That's how a five-yard game becomes a 25-yard game. And so I really like the way they set up. And I think the other thing that we're going to have to look at is like, you know, (laughs) the Packers run a natural three, four out of their base defense. So we have that personnel. Yep. They just got, they got right. He just, I think he just got, he he just cut out there for a second. They got what back? Um, didn't they just, didn't Kiki just got, uh, didn't he, he, he got released? He cut? Yep. Yeah. So I, you know, I'm kind of looking at the depth chart over there and it's like, I know the guys that, that create the run game for the San Francisco 49ers and you know, they're pretty smart guys. And one thing that they, they are really smart about it is when Kenny Clark's not in the game or you bring in your second unit, guess what? Now we're, we're going to, all those plays that we thought, man, this could be a huge play. They're running them. And so you have to have good depth against a team like this and be able to just keep filling in. Or guys like Kenny Clark, guys like Dean Lowry, Rashawn Gary, like they're going to have to play a lot of snaps yeah. in order to make sure that we can keep these guys at bay because we can penetrate and play on their line on, on their side of the line of scrimmage. What I'm concerned about is when that second group comes in, it's like all you can eat from the 40 to the 40. Yeah, they're going to have to be very careful with how they rotate. Now, one of the things that – uh, I'm a little bit more confident is the fact that instead of Tipa Nalii and Jonathan Garvin as your backup edge rushers, that might be Zedaria Smith and Whitney Merciless this week with yeah. those two guys coming back, which to me is a huge upgrade. And I'll keep, you know, Kiki being out um, definitely not, you know, maybe ideal uh, given the circumstances and who they're playing this week. Uh, but I do feel like TJ Slayton's played a little bit better lately and Lancaster can still eat, you know, inside when he needs to, if he has to start reaching to the outside and making athletic plays, it becomes a bit of a challenge. I think they have enough enough depth, but the, you, you're a million percent spot on in the fact that when Kenny Clark goes out, there's just no replicating what he brings to this team, which is why I think ball control on offense and making sure that you're not out there for 75 snaps against this 49ers offense is going to be very paramount as well, because if, if you're closer to 65 snaps-ish, 60-65 Kenny Clark can play 55, 58 of those snaps probably if need be. If you're closer to 70, 75, he's going to be at the same. And now you have more snaps where you need to fill in without him, which um, again is not ideal. So that's what I'm looking at. And just going back to 21 for a minute, I think when you can play 21 the way that the 49ers can play 21, I think there's very few as devastating formations that you can play in the offensively right now. And the reason I say that is we also know Kittle and use check can be used you know, out in almost like, you know, as tight ends are almost like receiving tight ends in a receiving package. If Debo is in the backfield, now you can motion him out. He becomes a wide receiver. And all of a sudden you go from what looked like a 21 personnel package with, you know, a, a massive fullback, massive tight end Debo at running back two wide receivers out wide. You go base against that and you, or you go a heavy personnel package and all of a sudden they switch one thing and all five of those guys are out wide, or maybe Debo is still in the backfield, or maybe use check is still in the backfield as a protector. And you've still got five guys who can go out and beat any of their one-on-one matchups based on what you have on the field. And that's, that makes it so scary as well. So it's not only the fact that these guys in a, in a 21 personnel can go out and block the crap out of you and gain yards in the ground. It's also that if you come out in a super heavy package to try to stop that, well, now Kyle Shanahan has mismatches all over the place that he'll pick apart as well, which is a huge part of why this 49ers offense is so successful. Yeah. They, you know, I just go back to, again, our, our base defense is, is a 34, right? And so we've got, like, you know, technically we have a natural fit for a team like this. But to your point, you know, I don't think anybody's out there paying money to watch Preston Smith play in the slot. <laughs> you know, or Sean Gary have to have to have to man have to man guard even a, even a use check, right? Like it's yeah. and the thing that's that's kind of scary about San Fran is 
they can leave Elijah Mitchell out the game and they can say that, and they can say, in their mind, they're going like, oh, we're running 11. And then all of a sudden Debo Samuel goes back there, depending on like what personnel you bring in. So yeah, that's, that is kind of, that's going to be the, the matchup. Now, the thing that can make the difference in the game is that if we can continue Rashawn Gary, and I, I'm talking very specifically about guys that I've, we've seen do it before. Yeah. Preston Smith, Rashawn Gary, uh, um, Kenny Clark, to a, a certain extent, Dean Lowry, we can create a new line of scrimmage with those four guys. Because I think Javonder Campbell has obviously been – had an incredibly – congratulations yeah. to him on the old pro nod, like very, very well-deserved, right? Agreed. Chris Barnes is a, is a very solid tackle. So if you can plan their side of line of scrimmage, Make that defensive, or excuse me, right? Make that running back change momentum in the backfield, not one cut, but actually have to change momentum in the back. You have a very good chance of being successful if you can, and again, being able to hold those edges. It's going to come down to penetration with those four. And it's really, honestly, it's going to come down to can you get off that backside? Because when they just start running their basic zone stuff and they, they dress it up a bunch of different ways. But bottom line, when they run to the right, Trent Williams cuts that three technique off like 19 out of 20 times and they just gash it for six, six yards plus. And that's a really easy way for them to make sure Jimmy Garoppolo doesn't lose the game. It is. And I, I think to go along with that, and I talked about this uh, on multiple occasions this week, but I think just them playing discipline defense, them getting 11 to the football and them having great fundamental tackling because we, as you mentioned before, this isn't a team that's, that's going to be a ton of air yards through the air, right? It's not going to be a, a, a ton of deep shots. This is going to be them getting it in the, the hands of their playmakers and their playmakers trying to break tackles, yards after contact, yards after the catch, et cetera. So if they can be strong at the point of attack from a tackling standpoint, and if they can stay disciplined and stay within their lanes, stay within their gaps, et cetera, I, I, and I think they did a pretty good job of that in week three. And I think this is, this is the first time in a while I've seen this team play team defense. Whereas at times under Patton, it's almost seemed like, and it's not just a Patton thing, but it seemed like at times that there was 11 people right. playing football rather than playing as a team. If they come out playing team defense, I feel a lot more confident about them stopping this 49ers run and, and having success ultimately in this game. Yeah, absolutely. You know, unfortunately, I think for, for Packers fans, you see the last, I don't know, let's call it four or five weeks of the season and they just weren't very good against the run. And I know we played some good running teams and some guy people have good schemes, but guess what? That's that's kind of what's coming in right now. Yeah, and you're in this cold weather environment. And you this is the first time. I mean, this is one of those games. This is kind of like the Cleveland game where you have this quarterback who proves he can make plays, but also proves he gives up the bag a lot. And he made so many mistakes in the second half of that Niners or the, uh, the Dallas game. That I mean, just critical misses. I mean, the decision like not sna like snapping the ball before before letting your left tackle shift and get set, like just basic football one on one stuff. That if I'm planning the game out as a member of the San Francisco 49ers staff, like we are going to, hey, we might give you those quick slants. We might give you a couple play actions with the keep pass and with the drag route on the backside, like things that, you know, kind of very easy, open space, not a lot of time to think about what's going on, not having to process. But we're going to rely on the strength of our team, which is Debo Samuel, George Kittle, uh, Jusic, and, uh, and Trent Williams. Like, I'm going to rely heavily on those guys to win this game. I'm not going to make it about your quarterback, which, you know, for most teams is, is kind of a, you know, an odd thing to say. Yeah, but it's true. And, uh, you know, you go back to that Cleveland game. If, if Baker doesn't throw four picks in that game, how does that game ultimately end up? And if they would have probably trusted their running game a little bit more and maybe played a little bit more of a conservative brand of football, which you you know San Francisco is going to want to do, you know, ultimately, how, how does that game end up? So I think there's definitely things that Green Bay has to improve upon from what they put on the on the field at the end of the season against the Ravens, against the Browns, against the Lions, et cetera. I think they will, but that's definitely going to be something to keep an eye on. One other thing I wanted to ask you about this, you, you mentioned the safety coming up in the box. Green Bay's like to keep both of those safeties back as much as yeah. possible all season long. We know that this is a different formula and different brand of team than they're, you know, maybe playing against most Sundays. Uh, do you bring an extra safety down? Do you play your normal defense and make them beat it first before you bring that safety down? How do you sort of go about attacking that or what's your mindset going in? 
Well, the mindset of the Packers the entire year was playing two shell, try to get home with four, tackle the alleys, and just let them make mistakes. Like we yeah. basically are saying, you can't go 80 on an 18 play drive without making mistakes. And I don't know, given the quarterback that you're playing against, this isn't the Tampa you know, team with Tom. Right. Given the quarterback you're playing against and the weapons they have, I would go ahead and keep doing that. Because, I again, I think, especially as the game wears out a little bit, second quarter, I think we can continue to dominate along the line of scrimmage. Trent Williams is a, a difference maker. He's like one of those guys that is going to – there's, we don't have anybody on our team that, that can kind of hold up in the running game against Trent Williams. He's, he's that good. He's that yep. dominant. However, the rest of them are not. Right? Alex Mack is not what he used to be. Uh, I like Tomlinson at, front, at the left guard, but he's, you know, he's not a, a killer. Right tackle is a backup. George Kittle is a, a, a great, great blocker, but I think we have guys on the edge that play extremely well. So I think we can pl- win on the line of scrimmage. It really comes down to what kind of personnel are you going to co- are you going to play in? Are you going to play in? Are you going to play in your true three four base defense? And you're going to have to walk out Smith or Gary when that ends up um, when they when they bring that guy out into the slot? Are you going to ha- are you going to be willing to do that and then deal with your running game from that perspective, or are you going to play nickel? Uh, I don't think you bring a guy down. I just don't think you change who you are for this team. I just don't think the quarterback poses that kind of threat. I think that's fair. And I think it's, I, that's my bet as well Is I think they play their standard brand of football and do what they've done all season and then make the adjustment if you need to make the adjustment. But I think you try to dictate to them first and, you know, and, and see if they can dictate to you and hopefully they can't. And hopefully you can stay with what's done well all season long. We're, we've sort of talked about this. So th- this could be a similar answer. So, you know, we can move on quickly if it is, but what, what's your biggest concern for Green Bay heading into this game as you start looking ahead to, to Saturday night football? I think offensively, you know, I look at it now with guys coming back and the guys that are coming back, Bakhtiari Myers, hopefully Billy Turner, you know, two out of those three guys are veterans. So I don't have any concerns that our offensive line is just going to improve their level of play. Um, I think that we match up very, very well across the offensive line. I think the, the one matchup that is a little bit, you know, makes you – makes you maybe a little bit nervous is um is armstead versus patrick yeah but you know you saw last last week you know street hearst those guys those are the guys and that left guard was just getting the brake speed off him for dallas right Connor Williams. um and then in early on like he's he's going the wrong way on protection and 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 hurting the hurting the games but we're pretty good at picking up games i think we're going to be fine from that perspective aaron does a great job of getting rid of the ball i know they have some injuries up front um I think on offense, everything looks good. Like we just have to stay on schedule. Like we have been defensively for me, it really just is figuring out the personnel issue. And then really the, the perceived, at least my perception is they have a little bit of a lack of depth at defensive tackle, not necessarily end because we might be getting Z back, which would be huge. But my perception is have you a little bit uh, uh, lack of uh, depth at that position. And if these guys are going to try to grind it out over four quarters, just making sure that we can get off the field enough to not wear out guys like, like Dean and, and Kenny Clark. Yeah. And, and kind of going back to before of, if you see all of a sudden San Francisco having 75 plays of offense or, yeah. you know, hopefully not higher, that's not going to be a recipe for success for green Bay. I, I think that's the, the, the same for me. I think, you know, that, that, that Kyle Shanahan offense is, is probably concern a, it is just figuring out how you're going to go about stopping that. But if you can figure out a way to make Jimmy Garoppolo beat you, I think you're going to feel like you have a great opportunity to win that game. I think Green Bay has more avenues to win this game than I think San Francisco does. I think things could go slightly more wrong for Green Bay and they could still end up with a victory where if things start to go wrong and unravel for San Francisco, it's a much more likely victory for Green Bay. So uh, there's reason for optimism there is as we go into this game, we talked about your biggest concern. What's your biggest reason to say, all right, I feel very confident that Green Bay can come away with a victory against the 49ers. We have Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> I, I, I kind of knew that was coming. I got to I gotta admit, I kind of knew that was like, coming. Like he's, 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 the, he's the best thing going right now, um, and, and he's, he's still a Packer. Hopefully he's a Packer for many years. You know, outside of that, like we just talked about, I, I feel just – you feel really good about our offense and where they're at. And even in the, the first quarter of the, the Lions game, we just, keep, we just seem to be staying on schedule. I think getting back those guys on the line is going to make a, a difference. 
But I think just as big a difference is now you have not one but two Pro Bowl caliber running backs in the backfield. You have guys that are kind of different situations, uh, different situationally or situational type of players. You have a guy that can really kind of pound this thing out in the third and fourth quarter with with Dylan at 250 pounds. Like we have weapons, we're playing better. Both teams are different than they were when they met each other. I think in week three, they're different teams. They they've figured out how to use utilize Debo Samuel in a way that is that is very very dangerous. Um, but I just think offensively, like you said, we can make more bad things can happen to us and still win the game. I think they have to really, really execute, get lucky, have us, you know, drop a couple picks, have us take a couple bad angles on runs that turn into long touchdowns. Like things have to work out for them to win. I don't feel the same way. Um, I totally agree. I I wanted to ask you this as well. We we sort of touched base on the injuries and and players returning from injuries in this game. I can't, maybe you can recall a time where uh, a team got this many players back all at once. It seems uh, unprecedented in my mind. How, how many variables are are too many variables to introduce at one time? Now I've kind of talked about this a little bit in the fact that every one of these variables that green Bay is introducing, we're expecting to be a positive variable, right? So whether it's Myers, Bakhtiari, Billy Turner, Jair Alexander, Sedarius Smith, Whitney, Merciless, Randall Cobb. It's crazy that all of these are uh, potentially being inserted, but all of them we're expecting to be uh, a very positive, um, you know, inclusion onto the team. But also at the same token, that's a lot of variables to introduce to a team all at once when I would have to imagine, and you can speak to this a million times better than I ever could, but I have to imagine that over the course of a 17 game season, 16 game season, when you were playing that you start of sort of get in, um, you know, comfortable with the people that you're playing next to, you start to pick up on tendencies. You kind of know what the person's going to do. You know how to communicate all of that. When you all of a sudden introduce eight or nine guys, and I know all all eight or nine of these are, most of them are veterans and a lot of them uh, are almost all of them, say for maybe Merciless have played uh, in this system for some period of time. But is there, uh, is there any concern there for you of introducing all of these players all at once and maybe not having that rhythm and consistency from playing with each other through the course of the season? So let's just start with the offense because it's, I think it's important that we, we split this up because it's two, it's a tale of two different, two different stories. Great point. If those, if you expect those three offensive linemen that you mentioned to start and play the entire game, which I would, right. Um, like, like Bakhtiari, I don't care if he, I don't care if he missed four years, like he's playing, <laughs> you know what I mean? He like, he's that good yep. and he doesn't need, like, I'm sure he has enough reps from the last couple of days, you know, the last, the, the last game he's fine. Billy Turner has played this year and he's been hurt. Josh Myers has played this year and he's been hurt guys. They've all been in the offense. They're comfortable and confident in the offense. The players that are playing around them have already played around them. So I don't really see a big, um, obviously not a drop off, but even, even this time where it's like this, this, this grace period where you have to get used to them again. I I just don't see that happening. I could be wrong, but I just don't see that happening defensively. I think what's great about our defense right now is you're pretty confident, especially let's just start with the two guys up front, uh, Z Smith and, and, and Whitney Merciless, who by like, I, I used to follow Whitney in, in when he was with the tanks, it's man. I'm like, I'm so happy he showed up and he's like done well. Cause he was, he was one of those guys down there. It's just like their team wasn't getting it done, but he's a really good player and it seemed like a really good teammate and good locker room guy. So good for him. For sure. um, but when you, when you look at their role, it doesn't have to be starting role. It doesn't have to, it can be a situational role. And then you're just using their skill set that they they've not forgotten their skill set. Right. So yes. that is a, and that's a position where if you take an L or you tie, like you don't have to get a sack or you don't have to make this play in order to be effective in order to just help the rotation. Like you can yes. just be a body at this point. And let's face it. Like, Z Smith as a body, Whitney Merciless as a body is just the same as the backups. You know, it, at you're not getting, you're not, yeah, yeah, at very, very worst. Now, the Alexander thing is the one where you go, okay, I wish he would have had some good reps before just to see it because this game, what's going to be, what's going to be super critical in the secondary for this game? Eye discipline. Like, eye discipline is going to be so crucial because that's one thing that, their offense really keeps you off balance with is your ability to just maintain eye discipline on not only the, the guys in the box, but also what, what, what's happening outside the box with those wide receiver screens and whatnot. So where did they put him? What position? I mean, it, 
like it doesn't floor me if you say like I think he's going to be a third safety. Like that wouldn't that would I know they're not going to do that, but it wouldn't floor me because it gives them a different perspective on the field where they can see a little bit more. He has a little bit more time to react, or maybe he hasn't played in the slot if they want to go man on a couple of plays. Like I, I don't know what their plan is for him. I know he's a great player, but that is one of those positions where you'd like him to get a little more game time experience before he got back in this situation. Yeah, and you also wonder, you know, if, if Jair just plays on clearly obvious passing downs as well. Um, and yeah. it's just in, in pure coverage, you know, because of the shoulder, you don't probably want him to come up and have the take on George Kittle or use check or, you know, Debo in, in those situations. But in obvious, I would passage, say this though, Andy, I would say if, if the thought process is that because of the shoulder, they don't want him to come up, he shouldn't play at all. Yeah. Because that's, because that's, a, because that's the kind of game it's going to be. I don't know that that's what they think, but if that was even a consideration it, to me, it would be like, all right, well, you're down. You're down. No, that makes sense. And uh, hopefully the shoulder's up to par and, and he's able to go and, and not have that be a concern in any way, shape or form. But uh, you mentioned kind of like if, if he can't, you know, if the shoulder's not 100% or like if he can't make those plays, right, then he shouldn't go. Same question for, for David Bakhtiari. And, and it sounds like you're pretty confident that he's going to be able to make it through a game. But let's say he, you know, he says, I'm only going to be able to make it through X snaps in this game. And again, I'm not saying that's the case, but as an offensive lineman, you know, what, how many snaps do you think would like Bakhtiari need to be able to play in order to make it worth playing him? If he can play five, do you let him play five? <laughs> so I'm only laughing. Cause like I played with Chad Clifton and he's a, you know, Packers hall of favor. <laughs> like he was amazing, but that sounds like something Chad would say. <laughs> like, I mean, I think I'll probably give you like 25 <laughs> good ones today. And hey, no one's going to test you for 25, Brett. I can't promise after that. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, he's just, like, he was that kind of guy. Like, he just kind of got to get that personality to him. Like, yeah, I'll probably get you 25 today, maybe 30, you know, whatever. Yeah, and I don't think David Bakhtiari is that kind yeah, of Yeah, I don't of, think, I just don't, I just don't get all. the feeling. I don't know the guy, but it doesn't feel like he's that kind of cat. So um, I, I would say if he plays, uh, you know, if, if he was able to even the first half of the game, it would be more than a worthwhile, but my expectation would be that a guy like David Bakhtiari is not starting with the intention of ever coming out. I agree. And I, I totally unequivocally agree with that. I, I guess where I was asking from is like from an offensive line standpoint, if, if a guy is not sure that he's going to be able to make it through the game, would you rather just have, you know, Yash consistently throughout the course of the game rather than know that he's going to have to come in at some point? Would you rather just have that consistency or would you have the guy like Bakhtiari play as much as he can and then yeah. bring Yash in? And I think it sounds like you're leaning towards the latter. Yeah, I, I would always bring the, well, it, a lot of people don't think of offensive linemen being that big a difference, but in, in these games, they really are right. They really are because that it's a, it's that one player that two plays that you get pressure. He throws an interception or he gets hit really hard. You know, the, the game changing plays, they do happen on the offensive defensive line. We just, we, we don't have stats for it as much, but um, he's, he's the kind of guy that's different finger. So as, the, as often as you can get him in the game, you want him in the game as long as he's playing at hundred percent. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think that's exactly what's going to be the case this Saturday, assuming he's able to go, which it seems like it's leaning that way. All right, Mike, we will finish things up with your final keys to the game predictions anywhere you want to go as we uh, head into Packers 49ers on Saturday. Yeah, so my keys to the game are, are I think we have to establish a, a balanced attack. I'm not going to say establish a run game, but I think we have to establish a balanced attack where we're not getting into that five-step scat drop back you know, situation that we did last year against Tampa um, in, in the uh, championship yeah. round. And on D, so offensively, it's just, can you maintain a balanced attack? You know, starting fast, obviously, would be a, a huge upswing, but I don't know. It's more important to me that we just, we have, you know, if we throw the ball 30 times, we run the ball 25 times. Let's just, let's just maintain that balance. Uh, defensively, we talked, I think, you know, we talked about these things, eye discipline, and then just kind of figuring out personnel wise, how you plan to stop their run game. But I, it really starts, I think, with the eye discipline in, in the backfield. And what's your prediction for the game? Ooh, so I, th I think it's actually going to be like a, a, maybe an eight point game. So something like 31, 23, something like that. I like it. I think I said, I'm trying to remember what I said uh, on, on Green Bay Nation last night. I think I said 20, 723 Packers is where I'm leaning in this one. So uh, not, not too far off. I, I really like Green Bay in this one. Like I said uh, earlier this week, 
I don't know if it's by one or by 20 or anything in between, but I ultimately like Green Bay a lot to come away with a victory in this game. And I think the biggest thing, like we discussed earlier, I think Green Bay ultimately has more avenues for success in this game where San Francisco needs to have a couple things fall right. And Green Bay probably has to do a couple things wrong. And even in that scenario, I think Green Bay has opportunities to dig themselves out if they would happen to have, have that happen. Hopefully that's not the case. I think we'd all like that. Um, but I think we're on, we're in lockstep on that. Before I let you go, what is the Mike Wall viewing experience for, for Packers 49ers? Is there a, is there a man cave of some sort? Is there like, what, what's the, what's the plan for game day? We have a, um, we have a room upstairs that we have a big TV in comfortable couch, comfortable, uh, one of those recliner sofas. Nice. I will definitely be smoking some tri-tip on the, uh, on the Traeger that day. Um, I can't imagine that there will not be scotch consumed in <laughs> quantities. Uh, there's a game before this, so I don't know when that whole process starts. I'm, uh, you know, on the scotch thing, but I would imagine the enthusiasm will be high by the time game time hits and, uh, whether or not we have, you know, my kids and we love just sitting around and watching games together. Like my, my kids, we bet pushups on every game. We prop bet on, but just all pushups and stuff, but we just, you know, find ways to kind of give each other a hard time during these, during awesome. these games. So whether we have, whether we have a couple of people over or not, I'm not sure yet, but uh, yeah, it's going to be a good time for sure. Oh, can't wait. That's, that's what it's all about. And it sounds like there's fun competitions going on. Wasn't sure where you're going with what you were smoking at first, but try tip on the grill. Sounds like a <laughs> try tip. Yeah. Yeah. It's all above, above water here in, uh, in Austin, <laughs> Texas. Yeah. Good, good to Boston hear. Austin weird, right? Amazing. Amazing. Mike, thank you as always. I always enjoy these every single week. Hopefully next week we are breaking down either Packers Rams or Packers Buccaneers, one of the two, um, and talking about uh, what they did well in a Packers victory. But either way, I will uh, be very much anticipating that conversation. Where can we follow you on Twitter and uh, what do you've got going on with uh, your podcast this week and coming up next week? Yeah. So follow me on Twitter uh, at Mike wall 68. Uh, I had this, I actually had the chance to talk to Dr. Rick Perea, Doc P who is a world champion performance psychologist. He's worked with players and teams in Major League Baseball, the NFL, the NBA. We met when we were both working down in Miami with the Dolphins. And his perspective on organizational culture, his perspective on getting like mental development, the mindset development for athletes, how parents should be treating, you know, their, their young athletes, their aspiring athletes, as far as how involved should we be? Like he is just such a fountain of knowledge, great enthusiasm. Um, you can check that out at process to perform.com or anywhere you get your podcast. It was a, it was a really, really insightful podcast. And, and, uh, yeah, if you want to check that one out, I think it's definitely worth anybody's while, whether you're a parent, player, or coach. It, it was awesome. Yeah, as a, as a parent of a, a budding, hopefully, soccer star, I should probably listen to that to see if I need to back off a little bit, which is probably the case. So, <laughs> well, you know, everyone's got their perspective. He's got, so he's got, um, gosh, two, two like legit units in his house that are high school football players, and they'll go on and play. And I think they're the number one team in, in, in Colorado right now and uh so and he does things differently than i do him and you know, which means he's probably right and i'm probably wrong but <laughs> you know we all have we have we do have these different perspectives and, and experiences and things we bring yeah. to the table and you know you know people that are super involved and you know people that aren't involved at all but the the the, the interesting part is um how you how the discussions that you have the expectations that you hold and the way that you kind of express both those are what is real for you, how your child or how your young athlete brings in that information is much more a consequence of where they are kind of developmentally than necessarily what you're saying. And that's kind of, that, that was one of the messages that he brought on. You should check it out to hear more, but yeah, it was super interesting. Uh, I can't wait to listen to that. Can't wait to talk to you next week. Make sure to follow Mike on Twitter. Uh, I'll be right back here tomorrow. Uh, and again, Mike and I will be back next week. Make sure to subscribe here if you have not already. Mike, thank you so much. Enjoy the game. For those of you listening, until next time, and as always, go Paco.